Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mareike Peterson, and as a uh, in my role as the chair of the TEDRIC subcommittee, Outreach and Communication, I warmly welcome you to TEDRIC's third webinar. It's a follow-up of our last webinar on the evolution of biodiversity information standards, and now with the focus how community standards really develop and evolve. And in order to better understand this theoretical process, we will learn uh, we. Um, to understand this process and um, to learn how you can personally really contribute, we will add some examples from the last Devon Core um, public review process. Our speakers of today are Stanley Bru, our TEDx administrator, and Steve Baskov from the Vanderbilt University Library. And both are, I think, really experts on the TEDx process, and I'm, I'm looking forward to their talks. So stand the floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to share a screen. Let's see if this can work and present. Let's see. Very good. We are here. Um, so here's our title: How community standards are developed and maintained. I'm going to be talking about part one of what has been codified in what we call the Tidewig process. And then Steve is going to take on the second part, which will be more about the vocabulary maintenance specification, the VMS. And then we're going to talk about some examples of how these things have applied in the maintenance of the Darwin core. So let's begin with a little bit of background about Tadwig. And the first thing to realize is that Tadwig is pretty old, uh, not as old as I am. But uh, 1985 is pre-internet. That's the most important thing about it, I guess, in terms of going back that far. But even then, it was about uh, the mission was to develop data standards and to hold an annual conference. Um, the thing about going back that far is that a standard was viewed as how to do something properly. There was definitely an eye towards actual data integration in the future, but without the ability to really do that without sending floppy disks around, there wasn't any test of compliance with the standard. Uh, so everybody was, in a sense, playing in their own sandbox. Um, and the internet made data integration possible. And with that, standards then became a critical infrastructure in science. Because without the standards, then, Everything is still kind of different and developed independently. So um, the original bylaws, um, the standards process in Tadwig, um, only proposed that a standard be supported by a majority of Tadwig members voting at the annual meeting. So it was very much a, you know, come to a meeting once a year and we will, you know, move things forward at that point. Um, that was kind of clogging things up a bit. Uh, there were another, uh, a, a whole other set of uh, issues that were uh, sort of causing problems in or not taking full advantage of what was happening with the internet. So we started to look at other standards bodies and how they operated, particularly in regards to the internet. And so two example organizations that we found um, as best examples, if you will, were the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, and the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, and in this uh, paper, that I, or this is a position paper that I wrote back in 2000, um, so this is just to show you that, you know, what's sort of present in this paper, the link is going to be in the notes to this. Um, but it compares the W3C and IETF with what was going on in Tadwig and, and talking about what we should be doing instead, uh, provides a few definitions, et cetera. So if you are interested in um, sort of ideals of what we were trying to shoot for, that's an interesting place to start. Um, but then looking at, of course, what we actually uh, codified for ourselves is what I'm going to be getting into in the next uh, few slides. So 
we sort of incubated uh, the thinking about other standards groups and what Tadwig was doing for about five years. And finally, um, in 2004, we made an application to the Moore Foundation um, and got funded to do the Tadwig Infrastructure Project, which ran from 2005 for 30 months into 2007. It was a quite a big chunk of money. Donald Hoburn was the PI, and we were able to hire Lee Belbin, Roger Hyam, and Ricardo Pereira um, to actually do, the, actually do the work that we had proposed. And part of that was then to revise the organal structures and the standards development process in Tadwig. So um, the organizational structure was revised slightly um, and published as the new constitution in 2006. And that was revised again in 2016 with Dimitris Correas as the sort of lead author on that next version. Um, the constitution basically sets up the executive committee um, which manages day-to-day -day activities, ensures financial integrity, government compliance, et cetera. And, but most importantly in this uh, talk is really tasked with managing standards efforts to ensure fairness and competence. Um, they also organize or delegate organization of the annual conference. And of course, appoint all other roles and delegate tasks as needed. Uh, the constitution also sets out uh, voting um, methods and, and um, the methods for amending the constitution, including the bylaws. So broadly speaking then, the executive's purpose I like to sort of isolate as, or, or call out as being to ensure socio-political integrity of the organization itself and operational competence. That's gonna be separate from the technical competence part, which will be a, a task or a charge to the technical architecture group. So, um, as I said, the, the constitution points to, but does not include the Tadwood bylaws, which is, really the process by which we develop and uh, ratify standards. So the, the part that's left over from the organizations not specified in the constitution is also specified in the Tadwig process. And critically those are what are interest and task groups. And basically they are organizations to help people develop standards. So the interest groups are the sort of the primary um, venue, if you will, for discussing problems, goals, methods, et cetera, to achieve integration and interoperability with particular kinds of data or a particular part of the biodiversity science. Task, uh, interest groups don't have a sunset. They stay active as long as members demonstrate interest. And they're responsible, um, at least in that, uh, first uh, iteration of the bylaws, they're um, responsible for maintaining the products of task groups. Um, but that's something that we've evolved a bit with. So we'll talk about that uh, topic in, in a few slides. Task groups, on the other hand, are in essence um, like projects with a specific timeline. They're supposed to produce a specific product within a specific time frame. And when that product is done, the task is finished, the ta task group dissolves. Um, you can see of the, the, the actual text of the Tadwig process in this link here, it's under our website about, and there's a link to the process document. Um, and you can see all the interest in task groups on the Tadwig website under community, it's up in the top menu. Okay, so both interest and task groups get established by writing a charter, which is then reviewed by the executive committee. Um, and there are charter templates that are available on the Tadwig website from this link here. Um, and both interest groups and task groups are supposed to report to the executive annually. And there's a big supposed to there because in fact, all of this is theory in practice, uh, we often fall short of mark. Um, this approval process, the review and approval of charters is 
the executive's real opportunity to coordinate and manage standards efforts. Um, and once an exec, uh, excuse me, a charter is approved, then we establish the sort of collaboration tools for that interest or task group. It also, the process also specifies that the exec should disband or restructure any interest or task group that is not making progress. And again, that's something that we have in theory and um, doesn't really happen very often, but perhaps we should um, be reminding ourselves to, to get a hold of any uh, uh, shake and rattle up any task groups and interest groups that aren't really functioning because I guess the critical problem there is that they occupy space, leaving it for other people to think something is going on when maybe it isn't. Anyway, so on to the next bit, which is the standards ratification process. Um, this is what we developed in 2006 as a sort of a compromise between what went on in the Internet Engineering Task Force, the W3C, and also in normal academic publishing. Um, Part of what was, I think, problematic of the previous way of just people voting um, is that a lot of people um, were kind of passive about that and they didn't really study or critically review a proposed standard. So the thing that we really wanted to engage with this new process was an expert review. So the idea was that a task group uh, would submit through the interest group uh, a a draft standard to the executive, the executive would check and see that if everything is um, in appropriate order, then they would appoint a review manager who would seek expert reviews of the standard um, and then work with um, the task group convener and the authors of that standard to respond to any comments and at the end of that process would make a recommendation to the executive committee. Um, and then once everything was, um, you know, the, re the reviewer comments had been addressed, um, then the executive committee would then move to the next process, which would be the open public review where anyone could comment on that. So it, it, our process retains both an expert review and the openness of completely public review. When something has passed both of those processes, then the, uh, a recommendation is made by the review manager to the executive committee, along with a report of the um, what has been received as public comments and um, how they have been addressed. And the executive committee may then choose to ratify and it becomes the, the standard becomes a ratified Tadwig standard. And then we move to the maintenance phase. So backing up then to review, we have created an interest group. The interest group may spawn a task group, which then creates a, a, a ratified standard. But then as we noted, the task group disappears once the standard or their task is done. So what we specified initially was that an interest group would take over the maintenance and the responsibility for maintaining a ratified standard. But we have found that in practice, some large interest groups with a particularly broad scope, it's only a subset of the people that are really dedicated to the standard that has just been ratified. And they, in essence, take ownership of that standard. Um, and so what happens is we recharter um, either a new interest group or a maintain, um, as a maintenance group um, or a, um, well, that's, that's making a new charter for a new maintenance group or recharter the interest group as a maintenance group for that standard. So this is um, flexible, so to speak. Um, and this is where we are, um, kind of making it up as we go along as to depending on the particulars of that interest group and what's happened with the scope of the standard versus the scope of the interest group. Okay, so the last thing that I haven't mentioned is this technical architecture group. 
Um, this was something that we was a common feature of both the IETF and W3C, and it's definitely something that we need in TADWIG um, because you know we're applying information technology, which is quite complicated, as worthy of its own um, higher degrees, et cetera, and applying those to our domain, biodiversity science. And not everybody can be an expert in everything. So we really need to have experts in the technology, um, what is current and what is emerging, give advice to the executive and to the interests and task groups. So in particular, we ask them to review charter as well as uh, charters as well as standards. Um, the formal charge to the technical architecture group is that each proposed standard as well as the overall standards architecture is technically sound. And so they also are supposed to provide guidance to the executive and the interests and task groups by um, creating a roadmap, a technical roadmap of current and emerging methods for data integration and interoperability. The technical architecture group was originally conceived as an interest group, but with the 2016 revision of the constitution, we, we um, handle it as a standing subcommittee. And the critical difference then is that the convener of the TAG is an elected member um, and is reelected every two years. So that covers the codified process that we call the TADWIG process. As I said, it looks great in theory, but it's kind of hard in practice. It does take a lot of work, but I want to leave you with the thought that the work is rewarding and it does make a difference. And with that, I will um, perhaps take questions if there are any quick ones and uh, otherwise pass this uh, off to Steve. Thank you, Stan. I think it, um, although I already held this hawk more or less describing the process, I learned something new. It's uh, it's good <laughs> to hear this from, from you. Are there any direct uh, questions to Stan? I think not. Maybe then we can move on to the more practical part. Steve, you have to unmute yourself, please. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, I think I have shared my screen. All right, are you seeing the presentation okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so uh, my name is Steve Baskoff, and I guess the reason why I'm doing this part of the presentation is because I've served in a lot of the different roles um, that have been discussed. Uh, I've been a, a convener of a task group developing a standard. I've been a review manager. And currently, I'm the convener of the Audubon Core Maintenance Group and also a member of the Darwin Core Maintenance Group. So I guess I'm the person who's like seen how all the sausage gets made during this whole process. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I just wanted to say that I, I feel like this, uh, what I'm gonna talk about here should be of interest to really three types of people in the community. First of all, groups that are working on creating vocabularies so that they'll know how to maintain it once it's done. But then also for community members who just want to participate in proposing changes to existing standards, it's good to understand how that process works. The other thing is that um, the executive committee, as Stan said, is really responsible in the end for giving their stamp of approval to the changes that have been proposed. And so um, if you're on the executive committee, it's also important for you to sort of understand what has happened behind the scenes when a proposal comes before you. So I'm gonna just briefly talk a little bit about some background here. So there are basically three documents that are official uh, TADWIG documents that govern how st uh, standards are adopted and also how they are maintained. Well, adopted, presented, and maintained. So Stan talked about the TADWIG process document. 
There's another document called the Standards Documentation Specification, which basically explains the formatting of the, of the human readable documents and then how machine readable documents should be uh, constructed. That's not something I'm gonna talk about today. Um, what I'm gonna be focusing on today is the vocabulary maintenance specification, which is really the guide for how um, vocabularies are managed. So one thing that I do wanna, a, a distinction that I wanna sort of draw here is that the vocabulary maintenance specification applies specifically to standards that are vocabularies. And we also have standards that are not vocabularies. So um, it's a little unclear how vocabularies that are not, uh, sorry, that standards that are not vocabularies are maintained because they really fall outside of the scope of the, the VMS. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's an issue that uh, we should keep in mind. So just to give a little bit of background here, um, Darwin Core is the first uh, vocabulary standard to go through this new process that Stan described. And when it was adopted, it had as one of its, uh, a part of one of its documents, this thing called the term change policy. And this was based a, a very minimal sort of set of guidelines on how to change Darwin core that are uh, taken from some practices of other, uh, at least our aspirational peer uh, organizations. Um, but there, as we quickly discovered, there were some things that were not clear about how that should work. Uh, and so there was a task group, uh, which I served on called the vocabulary management task group. Um, and it pr presented its report in 2013. Um, and that report basically said, what we need is a, a, a policy for managing vocabularies that was not specifically focused on Darwin Core, but on any vocabulary that Tadwig had ratified. And that was important because that same year was the year that the second sort of modern uh, vocabulary standard, Audubon Core was ratified. And it was not ratified with any explicit change policy because we basically said we're waiting for a Tadwig wide policy and we're just gonna basically do what Darwin Core did until something better came along. So in 2015, there was a task group that was uh, chartered uh, and for which I served as a convener to create a Tadwig wide vocabulary maintenance specification, which is what I'm gonna talk about. We finished that in 2017 and that basically got uh, replaced the term change policy of Darwin Core and became applicable to all Tadwig vocabularies. And then soon after this happened, the Darwin Core maintenance group and the Audubon Core maintenance groups uh, were chartered. And at that point, the responsibility of managing those two vocabulary standards uh, came into being. So, uh, before I talk about sort of the, the details of the, the vocabulary maintenance specification or VMS, I wanted to just define a couple terms that I'm going to throw around. So one of them is the term normative. So normative content is the content of a document or a, a, a term metadata that defines the, a standard, prescribes how it should be implemented. So the uh, normative content is, are basically the parts of the standard that are the rules. But there's also non-normative content that's included in standards documents that's informative to help you understand what to do, but not prescriptive. And in the past, uh, there was a, this idea that a, an entire document was either normative or not, but we've sort of moved beyond that to specify that some parts of documents are normative and other parts are not. Some parts of term metadata are normative and some are not. And the reason for this is it makes it easier to change the parts that are not considered normative. The other thing which I'm also just gonna mention is that um, this is particularly with respect to documents, that there are documents and actually to some extent vocabulary components that are um, within a standard or outside of a standard. So, um, so you can have informative documents that are not included in the standard. And basically 
the maintenance groups or other groups can do whatever they want with them. They're, they're not governed by the VMS, but any documents or vocabulary components that are within a standard then are governed by the VMS. So um, that's just a little bit of terminology background. So what I'm gonna do now is to sort of dig into the key pieces of the VMS. Um, the VMS is uh, uh, unlike the standards documentation specification, which is like really long and painful to read. The VMS is actually not very long. It's, it's only a few pages long, um, but it is a bit technical. So what I'm gonna do is try to give you a, an overview of what I consider to be the key parts of it. And I've stuck in some references here to the sections of the VMS that are relevant to these particular things. And uh, also in the document, I have included um, in the document for this uh, webinar, I've included a link to these slides. So if you want to refer back to this later, there's also a link to the VMS uh, and to the examples that I'll give later. So um, if this goes by fast and you wanna look things up, you can, uh, you can review those resources later. So as Stan mentioned, the um, maintenance group, uh, so, so when the, the, what the VMS did was to create basically a special category of interest group. Um, so it's built on top of the Tadwig process. So, and those are called vocabulary maintenance interest groups, but usually we just call them vocabulary maintenance groups for short but they are a special kind of interest group. As Stan said, an interest group persists until uh, it runs out of steam and you know, like there isn't interest anymore. Well, the difference between a vocabulary maintenance group and a normal interest group is it cannot go away. It's not an option to stop maintaining a standard. So the VMS says that you know, if the convener can't carry on the group, then the executive needs to try to call up one of the core members to take over because basically the show has to go on. Um, and the maintenance group really is given a lot of the roles that are served by the review manager in the regular Tadwig process. So instead of having a review manager from outside the, the uh, group to manage this process, the maintenance group itself um, makes decisions about how change proposals move through the process. And one of the things that, uh, that came out of the experience of trying to maintain Darwin Core without having these kinds of, of uh, guidelines is that um, if everything is subject to the full change process, it just clogs up the works. There are a lot of things that, um, that, can, that need to be changed or clarified that don't, ne don't necessarily require going through this full change process. So for example, if, if a URL changes an example, we don't have to go through the change process. The maintenance group can just fix it. Um, so errata and examples can be changed as at will. If there are changes to non-normative uh, content that are significant, the maintenance group can change those without uh, going through the full change process, but they, they do bear a responsibility to inform the community that these changes have been made. But if any change happens to normative content, then that requires going through the full change process, which I'll talk about in the next slide. The other thing um, that the VMS does is it, it, it sets out three criteria for uh, or sort of benchmarks by which changes have to be um, uh, held to. And those three for short are demand, efficacy, and stability. So the demand requirement is that at least two or more independent parties need to say that they need this change. If there's only one person or one organization that needs it, there's no point in changing the standard to accommodate that. The second one, the efficacy, is that it has to actually work. In other words, you can, it's easy to propose things that are not feasible, um, and so that's a requirement. But the third one is also important, and that is, does the proposed change break things that are already in existence? 
So sometimes there's sort of a trade-off between how we would like for things to be, but uh, maintaining perhaps a sub, a slightly less than optimal um, situation because that's the way we've been doing it. And if we change it, we'll break things. So those sorts of things have to be balanced and it falls upon the maintenance group to make that decision. So here's sort of a graphic of what, the, what we call the full change process for a change to a vocabulary. And as I said, this is specifically applied to changes in vocabularies. It's, it's sort of uh, non-vocabulary standards are kind of out of scope for this. Um, but generally what happens is there is a proposal and that proposal can sort of sit around, but it's incumbent upon the maintenance group to deal with these proposals in a timely fashion. So um, in the VMS, it says that the maintenance group at least once a year should look at all outstanding proposals and, and act on them, either get rid of them or move them forward. Um, optimally, it would happen more often than that. Uh, I think our aspirations in the Dharma Corps maintenance group are to do this every six months. Um, the Audubon core maintenance group has fewer change changes that are requested. So we pretty much um, act on them as they arise. But what the maintenance group has to do is to evaluate whether a particular proposal meets those three requirements. If it doesn't, then we uh, have a conversation with the people who propose it saying, you need to show that there's more demand for this. Uh, we, we, foresee some problems with what you propose. So in some cases, it becomes clear that there's just really no demand and the issue might get closed. In other cases, uh, it might get revised and after revision, be ready to move forward on. Um, but one of the goals is not to leave issues languishing for years. This has happened in the past and we're, and as Stan said, we're always trying to do better but one of the things that we're trying to do is to keep movement on open issues because the people who submit them feel unhappy if, we, if their issues um, are just sitting there without action. So once the maintenance group um, decides that the three requirements have been met, then they initiate an official public comment period. The public comment period is announced through as many TADWIG communication systems as we can so that everyone who has an interest in that change can know about it. And then there's a, a, a public comment period for 30 days. It's usually managed in GitHub. And this is the point at which members of the community can weigh in, again, discussing the efficacy and stability um, issues. And sometimes the proposal uh, gets sent back to the drawing board because it's clear that um, it's not gonna work in its current form. Sometimes it moves forward into an executive decision after the 30 day comment period is over. The other thing that happens sometimes is that the, the proposal just can't be resolved within the 30 day period. And if that happens, there's two things that can happen. One, it, well, if someone proposes major changes to the proposal that basically resets the clock, it, it more or less behaves as if it were a new proposal and a new 30 day uh, clock starts ticking on the revised proposal. Um, the other thing that is, isn't really written into the vocabulary maintenance specification, but has sort of developed organically is the, the route of saying, this thing is too complicated. It, it's not ready to go. And it's really too complicated for us to handle through this process. We recommend that a task group take this up. And this has happened with some of the proposals in the um, recent Darwin Core uh, adoption. And then finally, if you make it through this part in the process, it goes to the executive committee. And as Stan said, the purpose of the executive committee is really um, to ensure the socio-political competence uh, and fairness. So the, the, presumably, if it's made it through this part, all the other parts of the process, the technical merits have already been established through the work of the maintenance group and the uh, public review. The executive basically looks at what's happened and, and confirms that yes, 
Um, the process has been followed. Uh, there is a consensus uh, and that the, it's been an open process. So they're, they're really sort of evaluating the process um, more than doing a technical evaluation. Um, so it, it's relatively rare that changes get um, rejected, although it's possible. Um, the mo most likely outcome is that it'll be accepted. And then in that case, it becomes incorporated in the vocabularies documents. The uh, other thing that um, we learned from this earlier process is that um, a lot of times people propose changes that are really complicated. And so this basic change process that I described applies to um, what we call the bag of terms layer of vocabulary. So the bag of terms layer is just basically the term uh, label, the term definition, basic metadata, and that's it. And, and, you, and generally these sorts of changes at this level can be, just be handled by the normal process. But sometimes people wanna do more complicated things. They want to have coordinated changes that involve multiple terms. They might wanna add semantic layers on top of the basic bag of terms. Um, they may want to make some kind of a, a restrictions that are applicable to just one segment of the community. And so these sorts of things that, that, uh, that are on top of or more complicated than just simple changes to the bag of terms are called vocabulary enhancements. And, one of the things that we discovered is that like public review is not the time to hash out all these complicated things. It's just too, it's not possible. So it, these sorts of complicated proposals really should be worked out very thoroughly before they're submitted into the issue tracker. And a lot of times this is done through the creation of a task group, although the VMS doesn't require that. And we do have one significant example where a complicated uh, change was worked out by a group that wasn't an official, officially chartered task group. Uh, okay, and so if you have these more complicated changes, there are two additional requirements. And um, Stan mentioned that when the vocabulary uh, or, or the standards development process was created, we looked at what some of the, our um, peer organizations like the IED IETF and the W3C did. These two sorts of um, requirements are also found in those peer organizations. So the first one is that um, if you are proposing a complex addition beyond the bag of terms layer, you should um, include a feature report. So feature report basically identifies what are the features that you have uh, that you're trying to uh, um, implement in order to achieve some goals that you've identified from the community? And this could take the form of submitted use cases um, or, or formal requirements of what the feature should do. Um, and then once those requirements and features have been identified, they should be tested um, prior to submitting the, um, the uh, request for the change. So there should be a, some report about um, indicating which of the desired features turned out to actually be necessary and implementable. Sometimes it's discovered that like you wanna do a certain thing and it just can't be done or people couldn't figure out how to implement it. And those sorts of things should be removed from the proposal. And so essentially this is a justification that uh, should be included with the draft of this voc vocabulary enhancement. And that is, these two documents are very helpful to the maintenance group because basically they don't have to hash all this stuff out. They can look at the report and say, yes, the group submitting this complicated enhancement has done their due diligence. They've tested this out and it greatly simplifies the whole review process. It also allows the community to look at sort of what is the purpose of this enhancement and, uh, and has this group shown that it will actually work. So that's what um, I'm going, uh, what I wanted to talk about in terms of like what is actually found in the VMS. And so I'm gonna segue from that into the, the, the final part, which is um, examples. 
And um, I have, these are examples primarily of, um, of changes that have either occurred or are occurring to vocabularies. They're not really examples of standards being adopted. So um, when I'm done with this, we, we may wanna talk about some of those. Um, so the first example that I want to talk about is a term that didn't make it due to lack of demand. So let's see if I can make this come up. This was a term that um, happened in this recent Darwin Core push. And if you review this, you can see the discussion and the final conclusion by the uh, maintenance group convener was there just wasn't enough um, support for this to go forward. And so it, uh, it exited the process at that point. Um, another example of, it, of an issue is um, this one, the biome uh, issue. So this was one that was seen to meet the, the demand efficacy and stability requirements, but when it actually went through public comment, if you look at this issue here, you'll con you can see that it just, the comments went on and on and on and on and on. And in the end, the conclusion was, um, this isn't ready to go, but it's too complicated to handle through this process. Therefore, we need to push this off to a task group. So that one is still pending. Uh, there is not yet a task group who has taken up the task. So we will still have to see what happens to that issue. It's in limbo right now. Um, another example from the recent Darwin Core uh, um, push was a, a request for a term called subgenus. This also is one that had lots and lots of discussion. Um, at the end of the 30-day public comment period, people had suggested some changes. Um, the public comment period got reset for another 30 days. Um, there still wasn't consensus. So this is an example of something that basically spun out during the public comment period and is now in term limbo, which I is a, the state we really don't want, a, or I should say change proposal limbo. And so the idea would be that we would come back to this at least once a year and make sure that, that situations like this don't stay in limbo forever. If nobody really cares enough to figure out how to fix it, it'll just get killed. Um, if it seems important, then we may pressure some people to try to start a task group to, to get it out of limbo. But the goal would be to not let these um, kinds of proposals stay there forever. Um, the next example is one from actually from Audubon Corps. Oops. And this is one, the proposal to, um, to borrow a term from the music ontology called sample rate. It was supported by two members of the community. And you can see there wasn't a whole lot of discussion. This is a proposal that sailed right through the 30-day comment period with not very many comments and got ratified and everything was great. Um, that tends to be what happens in Audubon Corps because not very many people um, have strong opinions usually about what we propose. Uh, another example is the, the material citation proposal. And this is one which had a lot more discussion uh, and it made it through the 30 day comment period. But in the end, it made it. There seemed to be con sufficient consensus to move it forward to the executive committee and it became a ratified addition to Darwin Core. So hooray! This is what we want to happen for good proposals. Um, now, I, I also just wanted to mention a couple examples of, of these um, vocabulary enhancements. So when we created this process for having um, what we call the two kinds of user feedback reports, nobody had actually done that in the organization before. And so, you know, blessings on uh, John Majoric, who was the first person to have to write a feature report and an implementation experience report. Um, so he's kind of like set the, um, the precedence for that. So um, this what the chronometric age extension actually was sort of a pre-existing thing. 
from the the zoo arc uh, net uh, had these sort of historical terms that they had uh, created, but that had not been moved into any sort of standards framework. So they had a chartered task group um, and you can go to the repository and see how they carried out their work. But um, what I'm gonna click on here, this is the feature report. So basically the feature report um, explains uh, what were the features that they were trying to accomplish? Uh, and the details of, of this are not all included in the report. There's actually a number of references at the bottom. So this is a very brief document. The VMS is not very uh, prescriptive about what a feature report and an implementation experience report should be. There's a lot of leeway for um, what they can be. Oops. The implementation experience report um, also is a fairly brief document. And basically it describes the history and talks about who are the members of the community who participated in the testing. And once again, it has references. So because this was well worked out and these two reports were created prior to the proposal of this as an addition to Darwin Core, um, the actual, if you look at the issue for um, the, the um, proposal, it's very short compared to some of the other ones. There's, there's not, all of the discussion for the whole proposal is just on this one, um, and this involves many, many terms. It just fits on a couple pages. So the, the key point here is that if you do your homework ahead of time, the, the, on these complicated things, you're more likely to sail through the review process. The only other example that we have is actually an incompleted um, vocabulary enhancement. This is one that is in a task group that um, I am working on. And um, so it's called views, which is to develop controlled vocabularies for two Audubon core terms, subject part and subject orientation. So our group ha has had 15 video calls where we've been working on trying to hash out, um, you know, how this is all going to work. Uh, and so our, uh, uh, I keep forgetting that I have not returned to the PowerPoint. Sorry. And I've lost my PowerPoint control, rats. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, one of the things that we did was to collect use case, formal use case submissions from the community. And so um, we created a document, a, a use case uh, document uh, of who submitted the use case and what those use cases were. And then we used those use cases to develop um, candidate requirements. And so those requirements, uh, okay, that's not the candidate requirements. I'm having trouble with my clicks here. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, that's the, okay, it's still the submitted use cases. All right, I have the wrong link to the candidate requirements. Anyway, we basically took the use cases and this is how we decided what requirements we thought we wanted. And then over the process of actually developing this, we ended up dumping a lot of the candidate requirements because it became clear that we couldn't actually achieve them. And so where we are right now is basically having our final um, requirements and we're into the, part, the phase where we're trying to get implementation experience, but we haven't done that part yet. So uh, the last thing that I'm gonna mention is another thing that is sort of in between this is a regions of interest proposal. And this was a set of proposals that were a little too complicated to be dealt with as individual um, change proposals, but they were also not quite complicated enough to form a task group. So the Audubon Corps maintenance group opted to just deal with them at maintenance group meetings. And so we had a series of meetings from February through June you can look at the, the meeting minutes if you wanna see how we did this. And one of the things that we came up with 
um, was this thing called a recipes document. And this, so this isn't really a formal um, like use case thing, but it's basically telling people, hey, this is how you're gonna use this proposal. And so this is sort of an in-between in thing that isn't really officially a part of the process, um, but it seemed to work better than just trying to deal with this as a bunch of individual term uh, change um, requests. And so that is at the stage, it has gone through public comment. It's now awaiting an, a decision from the uh, executive and hopefully uh, it will become adopted as a part of Audubon Core. So I've burned through probably more than my time, but just yes, to kind of maybe. summarize. <laughs> yeah, summarize it really, really briefly, and then we have some yeah. time for question. Thanks. Sure. Um, successful management of this really depends on uh, understanding the process and the convener keeping the ball rolling on this. The other thing is the tracking uh, and documentation infrastructure, knowing how to use GitHub is really important. Um, and also the, the proposals that tend to be very successful are the ones where uh, the, proposal, the proposers have identified and communicated with their constituency well prior to making the proposal and that they've documented that their proposal will really work before they actually submit it. The bottom line is the more complicated the proposal, the more preparation that needs to be done before the proposal itself is made. And that could be all the way up to uh, creating a task group to handle that. Okay, so uh, that's a lot, but uh, hopefully that gives you an overview of some of the ways that people have handled uh, changes in the past. Thank you very much, Steve, and also Stan for this great overview of this long, maybe also partly complicated process. But I think we are in a good way that everybody is learning um, how to proceed. And this would also be a, my first question, maybe to the audience, maybe you can add simply a plus one to the chat. Did you learn anything here today? I, I think most of us did. And of course, there is time for questions. Okay, I see many, many, many plus ones in, in the chat. Is there anybody here who learned nothing? <laughs> no? Okay, thank you. If I don't know, maybe Stan, if you, you already um, were facing that, if you would like to be, have parts which should work better, where would you start? Since we are kind of also partly resettling the process. Um, it's, it's hard to um, codify how to get um, effort dedicated to these tasks. Um, you know, I, I think we want to, you know, our, our, our process and our specifications, particularly in, in the Tadwig process, the overall one, um, are fairly light. The documents are short. Um, they're to allow some flexibility, but to ensure quality. And I don't think, you know, so, um, you know, does it take too long? Is it getting uh, bogged down for this reason or that? Um, you know, parts parts of that are are on to the, you know the fact that Tadwig is a volunteer organization. There is nobody being paid really to to do these parts of of and and you know get these reviews done. Um, people that have that work in uh, for journals and have to get reviewers of papers. Um, you know, it's it's like pulling teeth sometimes, but uh, that's kind of what it takes to um, ensure that the proposals um, and these documents are of high quality. Um, so I'm 
you know, sort of at a loss to say where where do we get or how can we improve this process? Um, it's it seems to be by just more dedicated attention and and, and effort. I was Thanks. gonna sorry, I was just gonna throw in one thing, which is there's one more slide which I skipped in the interest of time, which I called open issues related to maintenance. So I just direct people to look at that. I think one of the things John talked about last time was that um, is this process, because it's consensus based, is it too easy for good proposals to be scuttled by a few people? I think that's one of the kinds of issues that, that we need to think more about. And anyway, I've listed some other ones. You can look at that in, if you download the slides. Okay, thank you. Yes, we will make all slides available after the talk. Um, Deb, you raised your hand at least shortly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, good eye, Marika. Oh, I'm impressed. Um, this is a really an, a very broad, open question to everyone. And this is something that happened uh, yesterday or the day before uh, with someone that was interested in and in, in discussing the verbatim label term. And some of you, maybe someone could put the link in the chat to that um, GitHub issue. So one from their perception, this person was saying that there was um, contention, I guess, or something between these groups and they need to coordinate better. And this was basically saying one group seems to say, you know, it's very needed and we need this term and we want it right now. And another term was like, well, other group was like, why? I don't know. Or another group was like, I don't know why I would use that. So their perception was that like the ecological, ecological community, the collections community, the people who are entering the data into databases, but they're not the researchers out in the field or downstream, they're data um, mobilizers. And the people who use the data are you know, in contention with each other. And I said, well, I don't think they're in contention with each other. I think they're not really working together because he, his question to me was, who's coordinating that? Who's coordinating the conversation between those groups so that they are um, working together to figure out who needs what and understanding those, those needs so we can measure better this demand and efficacy, et cetera. Uh, well, Steve's idea is the tag. But I mean, my, my point was to, from somebody who came and comes from outside Tadwig, this, this particular person, and doesn't necessarily participate in it directly, their perception was that there are these three groups that are in contention with each other. And I was like, well, I don't think they're in contention at all. They're, they're not, in, there's nothing coordinating them. Um, so what's y'all's perception about that? That there's, the, in addition to this notion of the efficacy, demand, and what's the third thing? Somebody help me out. The three things that you have to meet. Um, stability. Stability, thank you. Is there, is TADWIG that organization in the TAG? Is TADWIG the liaison between these various groups? I don't think so. I, I would think that that's part of the maintenance group's role uh, to, to assemble the input from the community broadly. And if there are factions within that, then I think it's up to them to do or to spin off to a, a task group and appoint that, that reconciliation um, as a specific project, if you will. Yeah, I think I think for me, Stan, it was more. I, I hear you. I I am I'm saying at a level of like Darwin Core Hour, like this is where do we take someone's comment like that and think about their role and our role in exactly what you just said? Because my idea was that you know science is full of silos, right? The departments by them very nature are siloed, and so this this notion of them talking to each other, working together. Um, gets at this notion of, is it really in demand? Well, did they even know it was there and that they needed to weigh in? Um, it's, it's a big question. It's not, I'm not expecting anybody to have like the answer, but 
interested in insights about that. Yeah, so I think the tag though is, is really isolated or, or specifically tasked with a technical problem uh, and advice. Mm -hmm. um, so is the salute, was there a problem, technical problem with the solution proposed? Could they devise um, a solution to um, what the requirement was? You know, let's say, you know, for that example of the verbatim label, um, one of the issues was how do you signify uh, multiple labels and formatting while trying to, you know, just be, um, you know, have a high fidelity to what's being presented. Um, you know, it's really hard to do that in just a text stream. Yep. Um, so, yep. you know, could they, uh, the technical people propose, oh, you know, there's this technical solution that's being used over here by, by this group. Um, so without, I mean, I think that's what their role is. Um, and, and, and in terms of just solving the socio-political problem, that's, yep. that's yep. the executive committee or the maintenance group itself. I think that's where I'm more saying that I see is the social part of people on the outside who look at that and say, you know, like their, their, their experience level means they see it as something, well, just, just do it. It's an obvious no brainer. They don't see all these other parts. They haven't sat at the same tables. They don't understand all these other uh, issues that you just pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this, and, and their perception is that the groups are not, you know, that they're, like I said, they're in, can use the word in contention. And I don't think that's true. It's, mm -hmm. it's more of a, somehow needing to constantly negotiate that space to, to bridge that. Yeah, and the last thing I would say too is that if some, some faction says, oh, I don't see a need for that, um, that really shouldn't weigh in against a proposal, right? It we should, don't all should have, or should not. Should, should not. Should, should not. Right? It's like, okay, well, if you don't need it, you can ignore it. You know, that's always a part of these things. Um, it's the people who do need something to get something done that we're trying to support. It's, it's, it's relatively easy to ignore a, a term that, you know, is not useful to you. Thank you. Um, we are already a bit over time. Um, are there any further questions? Maybe everybody is a bit, um, well, of this kind of impressed by this complexity with what we are working with. I think this, but it, it, it's great. I think since everybody learned something, I just have some, other announcement, but any other final comments here? I would just say if you have more questions, I saw somebody's hand go up, put them, put them in the chat and we can always follow up with you. Definitely. I put also the link to the Google Doc. You can add also them to the Google Doc, but um, I think you will also find the emails of the people talking here today. So I think this would be also fine. Um, if you haven't done so far, there's TED Week 2021 coming up in October, so please register. Registration is still open. And if you want to kind of lead the development of TED Week, um, there are also open positions in the executive committee. So if, if you're interested, so please contact us. Deb, yes. I would add to that, to all of you here, if you know of someone who needs uh, financial help in order to come to the conference, um, to please get in contact with us. So if you know the, um, please invite students, uh, postdocs, please get people into the community, have them experience Tadwig. Oh, there's a very nice question from Andre. Um, and we can stay and continue after we stop the recording if you would like, Andre, or we yes. can answer after. Um, yeah, we can also stop the recording. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to encourage everybody to reach out in your networks and we have great support this year. Um, and so we can 
we can help out and we would like to expand our audience. So please spread the word. Okay, Andre put it, but he had to leave. So maybe we can answer that question later on. Timothy, you raised your hand. Yes, I'd just like to know how you can implement these specifications within the realm of uh, specify, the pro program specify, or not really. Which kind um, of uh, specifications do you refer to? Uh, the Darwin core specifications. Um, well, specify is a data management system, so for your collection data, but there are mm -hmm. tools to map your data to um, to Darwin Core or other standards like ABCD using the BioCase provider software. So if you need help, I can guide you to people who might help you. Thank you. Yeah, there are specify people in this room too who use specify. Um, who are the specify folks here? <laughs> Maybe they'll put their hands up. No, there are a few. Um, can we, while it's recording, and we can talk to Andre, but would who would answer his question? How do we deal with change requests, uh, meeting the demand and the efficacy uh, parts, but endangering stability? I I think I'm trying to think of, ex of okay, hang on. Somebody is trying to call me. <laughs> um, I think that in the past, when this has come up, it, either the conflict with existing implementations has been resolved or they've just died. I mean, I, I guess this is sort of a problem with the, the, the like the consensus system is that a lot of times proposals just don't make it through. And so, so yeah, I mean, this is a difficult problem, but I, I guess the, um, the inability to meet the stability requirement basically ends up um, killing the proposal. But I would also say, no, that, that that you sh we shouldn't be letting backwards compatibility block progress. Right, well, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is uh, if it's unresolvable, I mean, I think it's more often the case where somebody figures out a way to make it backwards compatible and then, the, then you've met the stability requirement. I don't know the, about the second part of Andre's question. Um, for requests that meet the first two criteria but endanger stability, quote, are they just thrown away? What happens to them in that process you described, Steve? <laughs> uh, I think some of them just end up in limbo until somebody can figure out a, a way to fix it. I mean, I, I think in the case of of proposals that we had during this last round of Darwin core changes, there were a number of things that got uh, recommended that there should be a task group. And in several cases, those task groups have formed um, I, like the um, material sample basis of record. I think that's an example, you know, basis of record is very deeply embedded in a lot of existing systems. And so, you know, making big changes to that could certainly endanger stability. But what's happening now is there's a task group basically trying to figure out how can we make the changes that people think are necessary without breaking things. So I think, you know, it, whether it remains in change request limbo or gets fixed partly depends on whether there's a group of people willing to roll up their sleeves and form a task group and hammer it out. I think the idea of having that requirement is that to prevent things from just sailing through the process and then having someone discover they're not really implementable because they would break things.
Then Oops. yes, what? please. What? So no, no, don't know why my hand is raised. I didn't do anything. <laughs> but really, I didn't. I didn't touch my mouse. I didn't do anything. <laughs> okay. There we go. But yes, Steve, thank you very much for the explanation. I think this is really helpful. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for attending. Um, the, it was the third webinar um, from TEDWIC in general, but also this year. And I'm looking forward to many interesting talks during the conference, but also like later on this year where all the interest and task groups will meet, but there will be an announcement coming soon, I assume. So thank you.